everybody, welcome to this evening's event. We're really glad to have you all here and Tina and I are really looking forward to getting to know you over the course of the evening. So my name is Vivi Wood, I lead on programs for the Entrepreneurship Centre at the Business School. Um, and I really just want to, to welcome you but also share um, just a couple of initiatives that we have because part of the event this evening is also to share what we do at the Entrepreneurship Centre before we come over to our very esteemed guest speakers. Um, so one of the programs that we have is the Oxford Said Entrepreneurship Forum. It is a one-day event that we host every March. So if any of you happen to find yourself in the UK in March, specifically the 7th of March, um, it's a one-day event open to all. We have uh, keynote speakers such as co founders of Shazam, Twitter, LinkedIn, just to name a few, panel discussions across a wide range of different industries. This year's specific theme is Space and Beyond. Um, so looking at how entrepreneurs are pushing the boundaries in the cosmos as well as here on Earth to better in life. Um, the second initiative I really just want to mention is the Oxford Seed Fund. This is a funding uh, program that is open to uh, startups that have an affiliation with the University of Oxford. Um, it's around a very, very early stage, about £50,000, um, but happy to talk more uh, after the session. Um, so yeah, I'm going to see you soon. Hi everyone. Um, so one project uh, that I would really like to talk to you about to, to that today is the um, Creative Destruction Lab. So if you're interested in high growth uh, startups, um, in, independent of the field, so they're going to be looking at the, at the healthcare space, um, artificial intelligence, transportation, education, it doesn't matter. Um, but if you're interested in, in this type of, of incubator program and if you want to help shape it, um, please tell me and after, after the, the event this evening you can chat more about it and also I can be in contact with Thomas who is leading on, on uh, CDL Oxford uh, specifically. Um, I realize that we're standing between you and the <laughs> main speakers this evening. I'm not going to read uh, or introduce with the formal bio because you all have seen the biographies. Um, but I would say that uh, Shukri is uh, our moderator for the evening, and he is uh, also a member of the Oxford Network, the O Network, which is a, um, a program that's available to you as alumni. So he very kindly, as an entrepreneur, um, agreed to give his time to advise and support Oxford students and alumni. Um, so he's here in Johannesburg. If you ever need uh, to be guided or uh, to be introduced to somebody else or if you want to get his opinion on your business idea, uh, he's available for you. Uh, but also this evening he will uh, lead the conversation with Judy and I'm going to let him take over from here. And thank you both again for, for being with us tonight. When we start off a conversation like this, we, we wonder where did you come from? Where did it all start? You know, and I think. Um, as, you, as we sit here this evening, if you look back on, on your personal journey, uh, what are some of those early things that you can remember that you think have been intrinsic to the road that you've traveled thus far? It's interesting. Uh, firstly, good evening. I see one or two familiar faces, and it's an honor to be here. Thanks very much, and thanks, Tracy. Um, sure, it's been quite a journey. Um, the thing that stands out though is where I was born and the time I was born at. You know, where we used to have non European and European signs in this country. And as a child, it just didn't make sense. My dad has this, this tech shop where we lived uh, that he only ran over weekends. And around the age of eight, nine, my sister and I, who was four years older, we would actually run the tech shop. And I was the one who was doing the recon, you know, catch me corn. <laughs> so <laughs> I think because I had a figures information one, but I love money. <laughs> <laughs> the more money came in, the more excited I would be. So those are the things. And you know, it's funny because when you live your life, it's your life, right? Uh, it's only after maybe 30 years, 40 years, that you look back at where you at and you realize how everything actually happened for a reason and molded the person that you become. And for me, that's very true. Uh, a few a few a weeks ago, uh, Judy was um, given the Lifetime Achievement Award by EY's World Entrepreneur. Um, and at the event, 
I think you so poignantly said that this award is for the all the women who are not being recognized and the women who are still standing in the tuck shop or you know still playing the role of both father and mother and not being able to be sort of cast into the spotlight. Um, I think, and even as you sort of regale the story of your father and the tuck shop, I think we stand on the shoulders of these 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 un sort of um, sung heroes and giants that have come before us. That's so true. You know, it uh, it affects me a lot because I hate inequality. I hate taking people for granted. And if you look at this country, and you just, I happened to speak at the book launch of one of the young women who wrote a book on streets, you know, the changing of the names of streets in Devon. So I had to read the book, obviously, before I gave the keynote address. And uh, after reading the book, I said, let me just do an exercise of checking how many streets are named after women. Because everyone who's South African who cares to know, knows that we were liberated by men and women equally. The liberation struggle. People that kept their home fires by men were women. So there's almost a skewed contribution of women to where we are as a country. But you know, only, I think out of, I'm going to forget now, about 125 streets that are renamed, only 20 are named after women. And that makes you angry. And uh, I'm saying this because I see a lot of young people in the room. We have to change it. We can't just be angry and do nothing about it. We have to change it. Because if we don't change it, then my granddaughter will go through the same uh, discrimination, being unappreciated, and any less for doing exactly the same job, working two times harder to actually get into the same position, and all those dynamics that I'm very passionate about. So yeah. So when we think about changing things, we often speak about education being sort of uh, the vehicle of success. Um, and I think as much as you say, you are very passionate about money and figures and many other things, you also, I think, and, uh, demonstrated uh, a great passion for education. Um, and I think that in a context, uh, in an Oxford context, I think when one is exposed to the level of education at an Oxford University, or, or the like, there's a certain onus on you to, to be the person that is that change maker going forward. Um, and I think that as we sit here in this room today, that is really the onus on us to have a look around and be able to feel uncomfortable if the room is only full of men, or feel, feel uncomfortable if there's a daring race or class or any other sort of um, discrimination. So what, tell us a little bit about your sort of, your passion and some of the projects that you're working with in education. So, it, it hurts a lot that we're passionate about the same things. We've always contributed to education, whether it was offering bursaries, whether it was going back to our um, alma mater, uh, St. Francis College, to do something, give bursaries, uh, kids out a computer lab, whether it is building a community center in rural places. And, and it's very important that the few of us, and believe it or not, when you are within your circle, you think there's a lot of us that are privileged. It's so few. There are very few educated people in this country. And because of that, we owe it to the next generations. We owe it to the people that sacrifice for us to be where we are, to make a difference. Everyone has a responsibility. And I take that responsibility very seriously. So, yeah. so, so Judy and I, in, in preparing for this conversation, thank you for that. Um, we spoke a little bit about, and I think we both are quite passionate about, this ownership and this responsibility that you therefore have. But I think before we sort of delve deeply into that, you, you mentioned your, I'm not a confident person, and I think the, the irony is not lost on us. And, and often we find that not only in a South Africa to Oxford setting, but we find that from a rural area to urban area setting, that we, there's almost an imposter syndrome. There's almost a, I don't, I don't belong here. It's like, I hope I'm not found out with that. Um, 
tell us more a little bit about some of those internal battles that I think perhaps is not spoken about. Your mindset, your attitude to life defines how you present to the world. Because when you realize that I'm not qualified or lacking in the space, then you do something about it. You educate yourself. So, and it's really in the mind because you walk into a room full of men and this country, they are more likely to be white men. You feel a bit odd, but I never allow myself to feel that way because I tell myself I belong here. And even if people don't take this seriously, it's up to you because, you know, merit, hard work, then being prepared doesn't have a race, it doesn't have class, it doesn't have gender. So I think over time, it doesn't start that way, it builds over time, and you have to work harder if you are the wrong class, or the wrong race, or the wrong gender, uh, to actually you just work harder. That's the beauty about life, that it's up to you. Everything really is up to you, because you, you can overcome anything as long as you put the time and the effort, then you'll be fine. So I, um, I tell a story of um, this idea of entrepreneurial courage within myself. People always ask me, they say, so what drives you? Were you just, did you just wake up one morning and you just happen to be a very driven young man? And I say, no, you know, I, um, when, when, I, when my father tells me the stories of the late 70s during, a, during apartheid and he tells one story and he says, he looked at the newspaper and it said, white man required to do a sales job. And he picked up the phone and he phoned and he said, I'd like to apply for the job. And um, he had an appointment at 10 o'clock on a Wednesday and he, he walked in and the, the second he said, I'm here for the job interview. And the lady, the secretary said, didn't know what to do. She was <laughs> unpacking her, repacking her desk, like sweating, walked inside, spoke to the manager, came out, and then he got the job. And so when we, when, we, when we are having a tough time and we need that courage to push through, I think each and every one of us, some perhaps even more uh, viscerally and perhaps even violently have stories of our, of our family and friends that have kind of pushed through those kind of hard times. Um, and so I think it's an, it's an interesting one of identity because um, what I find is that, again, for people who are, have the benefit and the privilege of whether it's a private education in South Africa or a, you know, a kind of first grade education overseas, how do we come back and live between these two worlds? People will say, you're confusing us because you say you must be authentic. Why do you do that? I'm still authentic, but I'm relevant for the situation, for the context, because we have to be adaptable. And then I tell them that for you to be able to influence people, they should see you as one of them. She has to see me as one of them who's done okay because then she's like, I can do it. She's so ordinary. She's like me, and she understands my culture. So I think it really is a privilege. And <coughs> it is, the honest is with, with us that we do go back to those townships that we come from. Just sometimes, just by a child seeing me without you saying anything, they then say, I can be in the with you. That's why I became a doctor, because I saw an accomplished African doctor and I said I can in a week. So, and that's just how it is. We have that responsibility in what we do and just living our life to make a child dream to be better because we need. So it's a, it's a privilege. Um. What is, what, is that, what is that sort of onus and reframing that we need to have for ourselves? I went to the launch of a book by some academics editors, the African academics, who wrote about the challenges of being black in the institutions of academia. And they, I thought this was quite interesting. She says, I feel like I'm sitting at the, just at the side of the chair, you know, just to be seated, but I, I don't belong, I don't own this chair. 
because I'm the wrong class, I'm the wrong gender, I'm the wrong race. And now, if I'm going to sit comfortably and own this chair, I perform at my best. It's a no-brainer, you know? So one of the things I do even if it's consistently and I'll do, I'll do till I can't anymore because I'm dead, is I'll remind people wherever I am, wherever I have influence, to say, let's look at ourselves. It's wrong. Something has to be done. People don't like that. People like surrounding themselves with people who look like them and talk like that. And we'll never achieve our full potential as South Africans. Africans are cross race and gender unless we accept people for who they are and allow them to thrive. So uh, everyone in the room has that responsibility. You'll find that quite a few of us, once you reach a certain level, you feel for you to belong and be accepted. You need to laugh at jokes that don't make sense. Some of them are actually at your expense and people who look like you, you shouldn't. I always say, you have to respect yourself and your mother respect for the next person. Sometimes you don't have to fight. You just don't laugh because it's not funny, you know? Because when you laugh and it's not funny, you actually degrade yourself, you know? So I think we all have a responsibility to be very conscious of why we're there and the things that we would like to change because we are there and care enough to do something. I really believe in that. You can have a round of applause. <laughs> It was a very poor showing for South Africa, and um, uh, kind of a brittle team went along, and we were put in a corner somewhere, and really not taken center stage. The mm -hmm. role that we can play in South Africa on the continent, but also globally going going forward. You know, you will be respected because of how you carry yourself. You have a mess, and you know how you got here. And the only way that you are going to earn respect is making sure that we live up to production, we do what we say we're going to do, we ensure that we have an economy that's inclusive. I think we are now the most unequal country in the world. And it's just unacceptable. Growth at the expense of everything that's right, growth at the expense of an equal society, and uh, it doesn't make sense. It really doesn't. And I think sometimes we put a lot of trust in politicians. And uh, I think we've learned over the past 25 years that politicians are a certain breed. Each one of us can make a change. And that change comes when, you know, there's one thing I always say when I go to. Uh, when you go to a setting for the corporate uh, space, you know the class thing and the culture just by watching the lady who makes tea walking in. And you can actually see a lady who walks in and doesn't see herself as belonging to the space. She walks in quietly and sheepishly, does what she has to do. She doesn't greet anyone, she doesn't look around because she doesn't belong. Whereas a lady who actually knows everyone will walk in. And with Africans, you don't walk in and do something and You greet people, you know? How does it help us if it's just about you? You know, I was saying, Tracy, at the way at, at, at e EY, that mm -hmm. uh, in the African sense, you know the Maslow's uh, triangle? Mm -hmm. For us it's inverted, mm -hmm. because success for yourself is like whatever, success for your family, okay, you're getting someone, but when your success affects the community, when you make a difference to the community, now you can say you are successful. Just by having a PhD from Oxford, and taking your kids to a Rodin or St. John's, that's just a start. What have you done for the person who helps you at home? So I think 
if you remember nothing out of this, just remember the responsibility each one of us has because of the education that we receive and the exposure that we have internationally. I'm gonna be uh, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then we'll open up to the floor. So we so we'll start thinking about your questions now and take the opportunity um, to to get some of Judy's thoughts on that. So so what are the opportunities for us? I think you've kind of segued into um, the kind of call to action for all of us a little bit, but when we sit here and things are so doom and gloom at the moment. What are some of those opportunities? You know, when we, on a, again, on a, on a global level, we speak about the, the demographic dividend. We have a very young population. We have, you know, a couple of things going our way. But what are some of those opportunities that we can tangibly sort of uh, realize um, and start to pull the levers for as leaders within the South African context? We have so many opportunities, especially in this country. Um, I interviewed one of your colleagues, well, alumni, um, Dan Tlantani. Mm. Uh, do, does anyone of you know Dan Tlantani? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, right now, he is into, I haven't spoken to him in a couple of months, but he is into pet food. Mm. And uh, who would think of pet food? You know, he came back um, and he started uh, what do we call it? Um, is it but yes, 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 exactly. And he was exporting uh, food, especially to the US. So we have opportunities in all sectors. We have opportunities in agriculture, making it easier, making it accessible to more people. We have opportunities, everything you can think of. Thank you so much for. Um, so we're going to open up to the floor now. Um, any questions, please raise your hands. If you don't, I'm going to call out and start calling you out anyway. So we are going to have about three to five questions anyway. So you might as well put your hand up and, and not get forced to do so. Any, any questions? I want to ask about your point around us doing more um, and coming back with whatever we earned at Oxford to do more in the country. How do people navigate the challenges that confront them in the corporate space? And I'll give you a specific example. What would be your, your, your words of, of wisdom and encouragement to say if you find yourself in spaces that don't allow you to do more in the current economic environment, how do you in that space um, exert yourself and take up space to allow yourself to contribute more than you would have. And I'm talking an, an example that I can give you. Get to an environment that would talk diversity but does not encourage you to hire diversely. And if you're not in a certain role, you actually will not get support to execute that thing that you would like to do, one. And two, in the event that you decide to be outspoken, we, I think most of us would know people that have suffered the consequences of being courageous. And given the number of examples that exist where people try to do more, and given the environment that they find themselves in, especially if you look at corporate South Africa, it hasn't yet transformed. And it's, and it's not just one company, all of them. How in the context, in the environment that we operate, which doesn't allow us to take more without suffering consequences immediately, um, do we actually do that? Because the human nature says, you're thinking, flip up, I need to pay for a bond, I need to pay for school fees. How, how do we navigate that and not neglect our responsibility to actually give back? Because you're right in saying, people look at us and say, well, you get it. You are where I would like to be, but I don't feel like you're contributing wider. Okay. Mm -hmm. I always give this example. You are the helper at home, and the future of her kids is influenced by how much she earns mm -hmm. and the job that she has. Because we look and learn from our parents. Your responsibility is to be that face to that child of the helper so that she's able to look at you and be you. But not only that, you enable their child because you contribute towards their education. Do you realize that the sky is the limit of what you can do? How else can you be more? You go to the school, maybe you attended a private school, unlike some of us. I can go back to the township where I attended and talk to those kids and just inspiring people. So I think each one of us can do that. 
The biggest challenge I'm facing right now is the fact that I've been from smoking an African problem. And an African problem is what is in my venture, which is a beauty ecosystem. I focus on beauty products and beauty service. So we go to African people's homes, we do their hair, we take the averages eight hours to do what they get. So it's not a dream we want to go to this long term and, and have a problem to manage it. But the issue I find, especially about trying to sell the business, particularly to funders with the potential people who can support in any way, incubators, stakeholders, board members, and so forth, is I get the feeling that sometimes the only people in the business is smart or forward thinking or sophisticated enough. And I think what I would like to be to focus on is on potentially what I would call the penalty of solving African problems. You go to the likes of the boss, you go to um, the corporates, and all you hear about is this new term, solving African problems the African way. How do we overcome these? Because yes, money is not an issue, but businesses thrive because they need money. Um, thriving because you live in a revenue doesn't necessarily help your growth. It can help you get along, and someone might come and actually smash the idea and scale it up because they have access to the money. So what are your thoughts on that? Um, Victoria, it's a challenge. It's a challenge, and uh, it takes time for people to realize that the market, the African market, is big and it's growing. And I would, be, I would like to say, attitudes have changed. You are young, so you don't know where it comes from. Attitudes have changed. I'll give you just going to beauty and fashion. It was unheard of, not so long ago, to have Oscar de la Rente, Dio, have an African model. It's so, it's, it's a no-brainer. You have diverse markets, so you bring a model that reflects a population that you want to buy from you. But you get that now, Chanel has their models. So it's a journey, it's a process. And I'm always going to say this as an African, as an African woman, as a young African woman, those are three social identities that work against you. Unfortunately, you have to work much harder than everybody else. And you have to knock on many doors till the right one opens. There are doors that are open for African uh, people who are actually targeting the African market. Because if you say, you'll come to my home to do my hair, it's convenient for working women. So all the way your clientele are actually can pay more. They'll pay you for going to their place. There's a lot of bets now, even in your nails going to but now what I've learned by working the gym because I've been an entrepreneur entrepreneur for a long time is that over and above not giving up and not in doors, you also have to invest the money that you get. Your gratification has to be delayed. Because once you have invested enough, it's easier to attract more funding. So it's a, you have to work harder until the world is equal, until the world sees us as equal. And it doesn't heal. It doesn't. I, I wish I could say something to say, no, 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 do this. But that's just the name of the game. You don't have it. Can you say two or three more? So we'll go there with two here and then one. Two together. Okay. So four. So one, two, three, four. <coughs> and then we'll, we want that. That's all we'll take of you for tonight. Okay, so those, we'll take those four. Um, so a lot of things you said sort of resonate with me. I always said my two biggest passions are entrepreneurship and education. Um, so at some point I put the business banking and moved to Kenya to work for the first ever Africa education project came back because for me more than anything else, the one thing that really does make a difference in terms of like ensuring people sort of move from one strain to the next is education. I kind of I find myself a little frustrated, right, fairly often, because I know I come from a very privileged um, space in the sense that I got a full scholarship when I was 16 and to Canada to, to go to Nauru College, which is somewhere in countries that I'm of here. And I constantly see, like, obviously the significance of the importance of education. I also see the, the importance of entrepreneurship. And coming back home, I'm graduating last year, came back home probably six, seven months ago, 
I always find that people like you are the exception that prove the rule, and our education system is kind of famous, and especially with things like going to Kenya and seeing that entrepreneurship is actually ingrained. It's a cultural thing. You're saving with your friends, you're saving with your family, you're buying a plot of land with your cousins, which is something, something unheard of within this within South Africa. Um, and I, so it's sort of an observation, but it's also a question for me because I think my frustration is around the fact that I could mentor all the people I want to mentor, I could be involved in all things that I really want to do, but it's sort of like a drop in the ocean, and like really the issue here is A, our education system is just not built for entrepreneurship, but also the way government is set up, that we aren't enough places where there's enough support. And I'd just like to sort of get your views on it, what should we be doing, because we can have this conversation, but honestly, we're the privilege for you to sort of have this conversation. Um, the people who really need it, and the way the way you sort of need to change the way you think about most things to sort of be an entrepreneur, it needs to come from either primary school level or high school level. Which, since I was in school till now, the education system is going backwards, like, in my opinion. And guys, we can to bit about it back. I I generally see the things that people are doing now. I actually think even when I was in school, I was sort of better equipped, even entrepreneurially, to sort of deal with the world. And then the education system now is not as good, things sort of going backwards, but we just don't have that sort of mindset and I don't really know, you know, so like even when you, you sort of feel as if you're moving forward and like making and helping people, it's just like, well, you're helping poor people. It's a structural problem. Like what do we do with that actual structural problem? You know what I, I find helpful in that is that sometimes, yes, policy has to change and we have to have leaders who are for people and so forth. But sometimes it can overwhelm you when you feel I can't make a change. Because you can. Why did you start schools, Sisra and I? Because of that frustration. You look at the results, they say, wow, that improved, 80, whatever. And then you say, let's drill down. We are very involved uh, with the school that uh, my husband and I studied at. We actually support the school, we ask for the results, and we ask for the granular, like what percentage per child. And you realize that you're being cheated. You're just getting more kids taking maths literacy as opposed to core maths. Mm -hmm. What is it going to do for them? Mm -hmm. They're taking biblical studies because it's learn and regurgitate. So we said, we can't change the system. We can influence it. But we actually will start a school where we teach entrepreneurship, where we teach ethical African leadership. But more importantly, the method of teaching is different. It's project-based learning. Yes, you learn maths and science, you learn English and so forth, but how does it all come together? You come together like you do in the corporate and you identify a problem, you brainstorm around the problem, you put your project together. At the end of the term, parents are invited and you present your projects. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that how it works in real life, in business? We've taken it upon ourselves that we are going to create what we believe is right. Now, we can then say, ah, it's uh, only a few schools, ah, it's only a few uh, learners. But you know what? It's a change. Mm -hmm. And one person is able to make a change. And I respect what Kenyans do, and their education, by the way, is very good. But I think it's important to realize where we come from. In the book where I cover Zanzibar, I also cover in the other Richard Mokong, right? When you listen to the story, you realize why, why we are where we are. Because I think it's always good to have context. Because if you don't have context, you'll think there's something wrong with my people. Mm -hmm. Why are they so poor? Why this? To have a shop in the township during his days, where the government of the day says, this is the list of the things that you can sell. 
If you sell outside this list, you go to jail. And you know what you were taught not to do over weekends? You can't sell soap. You, can't. you know all the things that people in the township need during the weekend, you can't sell them because those people are being pushed to town. Now, I believe that context is very important because then you become patient with people. We have a house in Devon, and uh, you know you actually see people that are fishing uh, in the morning, very early in the morning. And my husband was saying, you know, it's funny that uh, you see a lot of Indian Africans fishing, but you never see Africans fishing. I'm like, because they're not allowed. You know what I'm saying? It takes a long time to unlearn what you think. We went to jail for doing this thing. So it's going to take generations to actually say, now I can. So my message to you is that don't give up. We are in a mess. The education system is not where it should be. But in spite of that, there is a role in the We chose education because we believe how powerful it is. And we are patient. In 30 years' time, if we still around, we'll be able to say, here are the parents that came from future nation schools. The pain, the money, and everything that goes with it is worth it if we can just produce 10 who actually change the world. Because it doesn't take a lot of people to change the world and change the culture and change how a community is perceived. It takes one, two, three. And if you can influence one, two, three, then you've done your job because you all have limited time and resources, but you still have a responsibility. But please don't, you see my whole hand? <laughs> please don't be. <laughs> uh, Mums Gray, um, I've worked in procurement um, and did my um, African Studies um, Masters at Oxford last year. And recently had a just a impromptu gathering of, of, of some of my cohort in Joba. And the numbers of them who said he came back home and he's asking why we're here. Why why we why have we come back? Why are we did what are we doing here? When are we gonna go away again? Um, you know, it's like for my part I'm looking to kind of step into Africa and because I think it's important that we've looked to bring our skills back once we've used them as so to use that internationality. But for so many of them, their families just don't understand. You know, it's like they're, they're fighting to stay in South Africa and bring those, and bring those skills back. Um, it's kind of like, it's, it's, it's an important aspect of things that, that, that they see success from people who have gone away and come back. And I wonder whether we, you know, it's like how do we get those stories out? How do we, you know, it's like how do we really push, those, push that, that this is, that this is somewhere where things can happen. It, it, it's a really important story that isn't being told, I think. Mm. That motivated me to write the other story because I think we hear a lot of negative things. We hear a lot of just one story about an African, which is not positive. The other story tells the other story that we don't hear enough of. And I think each person hopefully knows their purpose. And you can't tell them what their purpose is. So if someone is doubting why they are here, maybe they're still finding themselves because it wouldn't make sense to me that in a country where you so need it, in a country of your dad, where you now tell your things, those that I am may not appreciate it, that I can go anywhere, you know? That's such a privilege. I call it, it's unsafe. So I wouldn't be in any other country but this country. And not because it's easy, but because this country needs me the most. I wrote about a guy who is so rested because he passed away at the in October, Ali Mufaruki mm -hmm. from Tanzania, right? He got a scholarship and went to Germany to do engineering. 
and then the pieces that he wrote for his honors, he got a job at uh, in La Prosa, I think. And he was earning a lot of money. He was fine, beautiful job, beautiful flat, and, and so forth. And then one day he wakes up and he says, he goes and looks at the cars, you know the, what do you call it? The, whatever. Anyway, looking at the cars, and he's like, that's the actually mean factor. He's like, what's my contribution to that car? And which was minuscule. And he says, if I didn't wake up and come to work, I wouldn't be missed. Mm -hmm. I need to go home. I need to have a life of significance. Mm -hmm. You can have a life of significance in this continent. You can go back to London, but you're just, who are you, right? So it really is up to you. It's about what is your purpose. If you want to live a life of significance, if you want to make a change where it matters, where your grandkids and their kids will say, she left a mark, then you better be here, you know? And having a positive attitude is so important because you can have those cocktails where people are like, oh, this is the... Just be positive for goodness sake. Yes, it's bad, but you can make it better. And it depends on where you look. You know, you go and talk to kids in the township, you go to rural areas, and you give them hope, you know? So I, I really would like us not to feel overwhelmed, disillusion. Yes, it's tough, but it will get better because of you. That's why you educated. That's why you went to the fancy universities that other kids couldn't go to. And it's an insult to those young people who didn't get the opportunity that you got to actually then think we don't belong here, right? Because when you leave here, you are saying you don't belong here. But if you leave here to acquire a skill and come and plow back, be my guest. Chris Barnard left in the US. That's why he made us to be the first time in the world to do a hatch transfer. Do you blame him for leaving? No, he came back. That's my that's my take. Two more, like two more, yeah? Hi, how are you? Good, good to see you again. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, everyone else, my name is Naveeda, and uh, I currently work in public policy and responsible business at Deloitte. And I was part of the 2016-17 MBA class. Um, I want to go back to a question that uh, should be posed to you a bit earlier about the role of business in society. This is something that I'm particularly passionate about. Um, and I think we alluded to Davos, and there's this growing conversation about the need for what we've done as stakeholder inclusive capital, capitalism. And um, I understand that you've been in, uh, you know, around boardroom tables and in business. Okay. Um, and I'm curious to know that in those positions of influence that you have, how do you exert your influence around these issues where we consider, you know, things that go beyond just the financial and profitability, and how are they received around the boarding tables where sort of hard business decisions are taken? Um, because I think it's 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 all good and well to have these discussions in wide open forums, but when it comes down to the key decision making areas and you know, how, how is that decision? Uh, I'll give you a few examples because talk is cheap, you know. I was privileged in that. I did have some influence which allowed me to make some changes. <clears throat> you never make the changes that you would like, but since I'm a positive thinker, one step forward makes a difference. So one of the things, I joined the Board of Aspen in 2005 when my company had acquired the real estate together with other companies that we had consulted. And um, when I came in, I invited another African woman as a CEO, right? Because it just felt lonely. There's strength in numbers. You should always remember that. There's nothing cool about being the first and only one. That's nice. <laughs> you know? So, and then in two years, I became the chairman of the board. And I said, here's my opportunity. And I said, 
and the guy who was the audit committee chair was to retire, and we actually had to bring someone to take over from him. And I said, that someone is going to be an African woman. And if we are all agreed, they listened because of mutual respect. So I said, if we are all agreed that it's going to be an African female, we'd only interview African females, right? Which we did. Today, what we call a chairman is an African female. That is a small change, but it's a change. And it takes guys to say, I will stand my ground because I believe we have to change. The other thing I did, we tried this gender thing, this transformation thing, and it's hard. <coughs> I tell you, it's hard. It sounds easy when you talk about it outside, but human beings are very difficult to work with and change. So I thought, okay, we're not making as much progress as I would like. I then said, okay, maybe a carrot is going to happen. And at that stage, as the was already very well, and we had one conference with the international everyone from different parts of the world. And I said, I'm going to start an award that will only be received by a man. And the peers and subordinates will vote for this man because he will have empowered the highest number of women to promotion, whatever. Right? Now, that changes behavior. It's important to understand the people that you deal with. It's important to understand the language they understand. Everyone loves recognition. And especially that's been put in the Right? Because culturally, across race, there's this thing uh, <coughs> to look down upon women. It's cool to have those silly, derogatory uh, jokes about women. But it's not cool to be seen to be elevating women till you are recognized in a room full of kids. Right? And then everyone thinks, that's cool. So culture becomes changed because of how you deal with the soft side of human beings. So that's how it works. You study people, you carry yourself. They know you mean well. It's important. If you're going to be malicious and be aggressive and rub people the wrong way, there's a problem. But if they know what you stand for is equality, and what you stand for are better returns for the company because you invested in this company. There's no way you're going to destroy a company that actually has an impact on your work. So that's those are the things I'm just attacking. Final question. Um, hi everyone, um, I'm Jimmy and I'm currently working as an investment analyst at a company called 361. It's a boutique as a management firm. Um, I'm particularly just was interested in what you were talking about, about ad adaptability. So when you in an environment where people don't look like you, they don't speak like you, they don't have the same experiences as you, what I'm interested in knowing is at what point do you, your tolerance level, because you have had to be adaptable, it requires you to have a certain tolerance level to just make an environment maybe more peaceful or like you don't want to storm out and keep leaving or that have a very hostile environment um, when you are working with people that are not the same um, person as you. At what point do you know if it's a signal for you to actually change and do something different? Like as she was saying, let's say she's overwhelmed and she's tired of it and does she then start her own business and start her own school or does she mentor or does she stick it out and be adaptable in that environment? Because I'm interested in your story, you've changed, you've shifted careers, you've shifted different roles so many times. At what point does it signal when you're no longer adaptable and tolerant for you to actually be, be the change and do something a whole lot bigger and more different? Or to actually stick it out and be carry on being more tolerant and more and have that adaptability label um, on your forehead? Okay. It's bigger than being adaptable. It's about adaptability. 
achieving something, right? You are adaptable so that you can achieve. It's very important to be in the end. If you stay in this position, three years, three years, four years, go away. If you're ambitious, if you're not ambitious, that's fine. I'm getting paid, I'm in this position, it's okay. Let's just be adaptable and say where we are. That's fine. It's okay. If you're ambitious, the reason I do the different things that I do, it's because I'm ambitious. It's because I'm always, I'm curious. What more can I do in this world before my time is up, right? So I have to progress. I can't stay in the same position. I can't because what's the point of that? You know, you learn. You give, you get. If you're not getting, look elsewhere. And I mean that. The last thing you want to do is to live without a plan. You reach a stage in anything in life, whether it's a relationship or whatever, where you're like, this is it. You realize, no one will tell you. One of them is disrespect. When you're being disrespected, you have to leave. But don't be a fool and live without a plan. Work towards your plan while you tolerate being where you don't want to be so that when you leave, you are leading to something. So being adaptable for the sake of being adaptable and stay without progressing is an insult to the education that you have. Um, so thank you very much. Um, Serena's going to say something, but I'd just like to say thank you so much for a lovely hour and ten minutes with us. I think uh, we should get this video afterwards. There's so many nuggets of wisdom and little things we've taken out of it. So thank you so much. Thank you for showing us the power of remaining positive and resilient in a big day. Um, and I hope that we can all leave here something uh, with something to um, to be inspired about and to move forward positively. So thank you so much. Thank you. One quick thing, I brought a book for each one of you. Thank you, Shubhi, for, uh, for the lovely conversation this evening. Um, to conclude, I hope this gives you an idea of why we wanted to, to bring these series of events um, here. Uh, not only in Johannesburg, we were in Nairobi and, and Lagos uh, earlier. Uh, the, the main purpose was to, for us to, to get to know you guys, to expose you to people who are outside of the Oxford network. Uh, and also I want to flag that we have a few global shapers here with us, if you want to raise your hands. So the Global Shapers community is affiliated with the World Economic Forum. I'm an alumna of this community, so I wanted to, to, to bring together some of the people in the, in the Johannesburg Hub as well. And we also have an uh, Aspen African Leadership Initiative Fellow that I know of, that's Catherine. She's also an Oxford alum. I don't know if we have any as other Aspen people in the room. I used to work for the Aspen Institute. Yeah. Um, you are an, an alumna of the Aspen yeah. Oxford Seminar, which I brought to Oxford because I'm obsessed with the Aspen Institute. <laughs> um, but the whole idea is to bring people together, to, to have you talk about what you're working on, what are the things that you could be working on uh, together from now on, and um, what else? We have wine and drinks and canapes, and you're welcome to stay with us for a bit longer and enjoy everything we've prepared for you guys. But thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I didn't, I didn't get someone to get there. Sure.